If you have your Bibles, I would ask if you can turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, we will read the scriptures, and then I'll pray, and then I will give us what the Lord has us to hear this morning. Isaiah chapter 6, and we read from verse 1 to verse 8. In the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. No one called out to another and said, Holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called out, while the house of God was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, Yahweh of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Last pray. Our Lord, we, your people, have been formed by your word, and we, your people, are sustained by it. Lord, as we marvel at you, our God, you, our King, the King of hosts, you cause us, Lord, to fall before our knees in worship of you. And may cause us to be those who are marked by gratitude in light of what you have done for us sinners. So help us see Jesus lifted high and exalted. And may this cause us to love him even more this week. In Jesus' name we pray. So Isaiah chapter 6 is a text that is one of the centerpieces of all scripture. And the fact that it represents God in his exaltation. And Isaiah tells us the one who is seated on the throne is the king, Yahweh of hosts, or the Lord of hosts. This text is particularly spoken to this nation because as Isaiah is writing, verse, chapter 1 from verse 1 to chapter 5, he has been speaking against the ungodliness of the people of Judah, despite the fact that through King Uzziah, God had restored, in some sense, the fortunes of Judah, still they strayed away from his commands. He was their God, but yet they trusted on idols. They trusted on the king. They trusted on themselves. And Uzziah marks this particular straying away from God, because in his exaltation, he became proud. And the Lord, out of his mercy and out of his judgment, struck him with leprosy when he tried to offer sacrifices in the temple. And for a period of time, he was secluded from the people and from reigning as a king since he was a man who was full of leprosy and therefore unclean. And in 740 BC, Isaiah sees God because on this particular year is the year that King Uzziah dies. And he sees the Lord exalted. You can observe from verse 1 and verse 2 the exaltation of God. He's sitting on a throne. And the train of his robe is filling the whole temple. And beside him and on top of him are seraphims, these great creatures, the ones the scriptures call the burning ones. They are serving this king. 
So his majesty is demonstrated by that. But observe what they are saying in verse 3. They say, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I think this is an important text as we think about missions because it answers two questions that we might have. Why do we need to go? The first question. And secondly, who is to be sent to go? Verse 3 tells us the answer to the first question. We go because God is holy and majestic. He is described as the one who is the Lord of hosts, meaning he is, he is the one who commands the mighty armies of angels in heaven. But observe the second portion, the whole earth is full of his glory. This God who is called holy, holy three times. And in the Jewish understanding, whenever they repeat, it's to emphasize God is marked by holiness. Holiness is his character. It is what marks him as God. Secondly, observe, his holiness is also seen in his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. So answering the question, the second answer to that question, why do we need to go? We go not just because God is holy and majestic. Secondly, we go because God makes a claim for himself of all peoples. In all the earth, the whole earth is full of his glory. Psalm 24 talks about this. He says, the earth and the fullness thereof belongs to God and everyone who dwells in the earth. So God makes a claim. Everyone everywhere is to be submitted to him as the creator, as the king. And this is the reason why you and I are sitting here to be encouraged towards doing what we're already doing and doing it further because God has a claim for all the nations, all the flags represented here. This is the reason why in Psalm chapter 2, the Lord asks the Lord, who is Christ? The Father asks Jesus, ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth, your portion. This is the reason why you and I are called to go. We are called to go because God has a claim. But even as he makes this claim, he makes a claim not just as a ruler, but he makes a claim as the one who sets the rules. He is the moral standard. He is the one everyone is to submit to. But how are they to submit? They're to submit to his law. And as the nation of Judah realizes, Many of the times, all nations have departed from God and his law. They have forsaken the knowledge that is in creation and in their conscience. And that is the reason why in Acts chapter 17, God makes this claim that in olden times, God ignored what people had done. But now, but now he commands everyone, everywhere to repent. For he has marked a day when he will judge all peoples through this man, Christ Jesus. But secondly, observe, who then is sent to go to this people? Look at verse 5. Then I say to me, as I behold, Isaiah says, this holiness of God, this majesty of the king, Woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. So only the convicted, only the confessing, only the contrite sinners are called to go. Observe how he says it. He says, I am a ruined man. In verse, chapter 5, verse 20, he speaks doom against Judah because of their sin. And in chapter 6, verse 5, we see he speaks doom, the seventh doom he speaks, against himself. Why was he damned? He gives an answer, because I am a man of unclean lips. 
And the next portion, for my eyes have seen the king Yahweh of hosts. He is a man who is full of sin, unclean, and he points towards his lips. And as we think about this in Matthew, the Lord calls us to think about lips as a pointer, as a gateway to the heart. So as he says, he's a man of unclean lips, he's essentially saying, I am unclean. I am not worthy to have God as my God. I should be damned. Not only should I be damned, I am damned because I am unclean and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. Therefore, I shouldn't have the praises the seraphims have in my lips because my lips are unclean. But observe as well, the Lord does not leave him to his own devices. The Lord does not damn him because as we see throughout scripture, every single time God appears to his people, he appears so that by his appearing, he will bring them down to lift them up. This is why in Isaiah 57 verse 15, thinking about this text, he says, I am the Lord who dwells in the high and lofty place, but I dwell amongst a people who are contract. So the seraphim then flies towards Isaiah in verse 6. And in verse 7, he flies not to bring damnation and judgment, but to bring cleansing and salvation. Look at verse 7. And he touched my lips and said, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is atoned for. This seraphim flies with burning coals from an altar. This is the altar of incense, as we'll see in, the, in Leviticus chapter 16 and throughout the scriptures. There were two altars, the burning altar where the burnt offerings were offered and the incense which stood before the temple of God. And in this particular altar, the angel takes the tongue which he touches Isaiah with. And when he touches Isaiah, Rather than damnation, we see salvation. So the second answer to the question, who is sent to go is only the pardoned, only the cleansed, only the spared sinners are sent. So in God's mercy, this burning coal symbolizes God's mercy to Isaiah. He is cleansed because those burning coals were used to burn a sacrifice, as we'll see, because they were the ones that were used to burn incense. But they came from the first altar that was outside the holies of holies. So if this is what Isaiah discovers, it has to be through someone else, through a substitute that his sin is taken away. It has to be through sacrifice. Doesn't this point to what you and I have received in Christ? Our sins were taken away, not because of anything we had done in ourselves, as Titus will tell us, but because of God in his mercy and kindness through Jesus. Jesus pays the penalty that you and I ought to bear. He is the one who is damned that you and I will be set free. He is the one who has brought this judgment that is due to our sin. So that you and I not only will be pardoned, but look at verse 7. Not only your iniquity is taken away, but your sin atoned for. God does not sweep sin under the cosmic carpet. No, God has to punish sin. Someone has to satisfy the wrath of God. And in the Old Testament, we see it through the sacrifices, which are types of what is to come, shadows of Christ, who is the ultimate sacrifice. But number three, observe, not only are those who are washed and cleansed, our sins have been taken away like the scapegoat. Our sins have been atoned for like the sacrifice on the altar that was killed on behalf of the sinner. But look at verse eight. Only a cleansed and pardoned sinner is qualified to speak to a sinful people on behalf of God. He says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. 
It's only after pardon and cleansing was there enough courage for Isaiah to speak out and stand out. Only by the mercy of God in cleansing and pardon was Isaiah's ears ready to hear the Lord speak. Because in him speaking, he wasn't just speaking to everyone sitting. Because if he had, all the angels would have assembled to obey. But he was particularly speaking to Isaiah. But Isaiah was not ready until he received his pardon and cleansing. And we see what the Lord says. Here I am, therefore send me. It is until this time when there is pardon was their courage in Isaiah to say, Lord, send me. But saints, have we not been redeemed by Christ? Is this not the reason why you and I should go? You and I should go to the various places the Lord has already placed us. We are fathers, we are mothers, we are grandparents. We are called, first and foremost, to make Christ known to those who are closest to us. Then secondly, the law calls us to go to our workplaces. Then thirdly, the law calls us to go to our neighbors. Fourthly, the law calls us to go to the outer parts of the world. This is why missions exist, because God is not worshipped amongst the nations. But how will we go to the nations if we are not faithfully making Christ known to those who are at home? Saints, have we become desensitized and apathetic to the work of Christ? It is this holiness that we seek to make clear to people to know the reason why you need the gospel is because of your sin. And yes, your sin secludes you, your sin damns you, but God in his mercy has offered Jesus for you. This is why we go. But do you go as well as Isaiah in cheerfulness and gratitude for what God has done for you? We go because God is holy. We go because God makes a claim to himself. But we also go because we have been redeemed and forgiven. With cheerfulness, with joy in our hearts. Going with the gospel, planting seeds. And praying that those seeds will blossom. Saints, I would want to challenge you, even as we sit here and have deliberations on things that we are doing and things that we hope to do. My prayer is, first and foremost, seek God in his holiness. May this fuel your engine once again to go next week, coming days, to make Christ known where you are. We exist to make Christ known, saints. Because you and I have been redeemed. May this be the mission we carry. May this be the crying call that you and I receive. So that Jesus, Jesus alone, who has a claim on every nation, will be glorified. And his inheritance will come to him. That's true. Lord, you are holy. You are majestic. And you're above all. And that's why as we marvel at Isaiah 6, we see you're served by the seraphims who are quick because they are flying and they are ready to do your bidding. And we ask as your people, even as you have given us a commission, even as you have given us the redemption, the forgiveness of our sin, help us to see you in your holiness and help us like the seraphim to obey your call, to be in many ways, ministers of this gospel, ambassadors, emissaries, messengers of this good news that you have placed before us. May Jesus be exalted, and may he have the nations as inheritance. In Jesus' name we pray. 